Thanks very much for that introduction, Helen. So um, someone asked me today, uh, is the LHC clapped out? Is it finished? Is that why you're planning the next one? I'm going to say no, because my job for the next 15 years at least depends on it. The LHC is definitely not clapped out. But what we are here to talk about tonight is what will, what hopefully might come after this, this amazing machine. So just, to, just so in case you haven't met the Large Hadron Collider, here it is. This is um, an aerial shot taken uh, from the sort of direction of the Jura Mountains looking north uh, towards the Alps. And you can see Lake Geneva there, that grey smudge in the distance is the city of Geneva, that big high mountain is Mont Blanc, and then marked in, in yellow on the countryside is the root of the biggest scientific instrument that's ever been built by human beings, the Large Hadron Collider. So this is where I work, um, and, and this machine, in a way, particle physics is the sort of simplest, most brutal thing you can think about doing scientifically. We want to know what things are made of, so what do we do? Well, we take projectiles, we whiz them around very, very fast, we smash them into each other, and we see what happens. And that's what this machine does. Uh, so at, at some, some point over here at CERN, there is a bottle of ordinary high hydrogen gas. The hydrogen is ionized to produce protons. The protons are whizzed around a series of accelerators, which were sort of at one point the biggest at CERN, back in the, in this one called the super proton synchrotron, which used to be the biggest particle accelerator in the world, the most powerful one in the 1980s, and then it goes into the LHC. They go round and round in a circle, they're accelerated to 99.999999% of the speed of light, and then they collide into each other in four detectors which are spaced around the ring. And when that happens, this is what you get. Um, so, uh, particle colliders, what, what they really do is they probe the structure of the universe, the structure of reality at the shortest distance possible. So this is in a way acting like a gigantic microscope. And when you have this much energy loaded onto these protons, when they collide, that kinetic energy, the energy of their motion, is converted into new particles. So what you're seeing here are not the innards of the proton necessarily, although they are mixed up in this picture, but actually particles being created out of energy that didn't exist before. And then people like me scan through trillions and trillions of these sorts of collisions in search of signs of new particles like like the Higgs boson. So, so that's what the LHC does, and that's what all particle accelerators do. So, uh, and as I said, this, this machine is gonna, has quite a long life still ahead of it, and we're hoping that the LHC will deliver some exciting discoveries still in the coming years. But the reason we're already thinking about what comes after is if you, uh, the actual first sort of conversations about building the Large Hadron Collider took place in the late 1970s. The LHC didn't start colliding until 2009. So that gives you a sense of the timescales involved in these projects. So if you want to have a machine ready for when the LHC switches off, we need to start planning it now. So um, the, the big news, as, as Helen mentioned in her intro, that's come out of the LHC so far is the discovery of a particle that was first predicted in the mid-1960s, which is known as the Higgs boson. And I'll talk about it a bit more later on in the talk, but um, very briefly, what this discovery tells us is that there is an invisible energy field everywhere in the universe. It's in this room right now. It's called the Higgs field, and it's this field that gives mass to the elementary particles that make up the universe. And that's the, the great triumph of the LHC so far. And it's, and it's also sort of, in a way, this discovery finished the 20th century uh, sort of model of particle physics known as the standard model. So this is our current best description of what the universe is made out of and the forces that bind the different elementary particles together. So I'll very quickly just introduce you to some of the, the particles in this table, just so you know when I use words like quark, you know what I'm talking about. So um, there are... First of all, we have the electron, which is the particle that goes around the outside of atoms. It's negatively charged. And then we have two quarks, called the up quark and the down quark. And these make up the nuclei of atoms. So these are the three basic ingredients of all the ordinary matter in the universe. That's all we are. We're just made of electrons and these two quarks arranged in a variety of different ways. Um, and then there's a bunch of other particles. There's one called a neutrino. and there are, These are sort of like ghostly things that are going through us. There are uh, trillions of them actually going through your body right now, but you're not aware of them because they very, very rarely interact with ordinary matter. And then for some reason which we don't understand, uh, nature provides us with additional copies of these particles. So these are two extra columns in this table, which have more or less the same properties as the, the electron and the quarks, but they're heavier and they're unstable. So you can make these exotic particles in collider experiments, for example, but they don't hang around very long. They quickly decay down into what we call the first generation in this table. 
Then there are a bunch of particles which are associated with the different forces of nature. So there are three forces in the standard model of particle physics. One which is missing, which is gravity, but the three, short, the, the three uh, quantum forces, which are the electromagnetic force, and there's a particle called the photon, which transmits that. And then there's the strong nuclear force, uh, which binds the quarks together inside the nucleus of an atom. And that has a, a force carrier called the gluon, because it's gluey, it sticks these quarks together. And then there are some weird particles called the Z and the W boson, which are, in, they, these are the particles that transmit a force called the weak nuclear force, which is associated with radioactive decay and when one type of particle transforms into another. So that's more or less all of particle physics in about a minute or so. so um, and then th this was the picture of our understanding of the universe on the 3rd of July 2012. And then on the 4th of July, uh, Higgs Dependence Day, CERN announced the discovery of the final piece of this, this puzzle, the Higgs boson. So the discovery of the Higgs was, was really at the end of the story of the standard model in some sense, the last missing piece of this, of this theory. Now, um, that's not to say, though, that the standard model is the end of the story. We know that there are many problems in fundamental physics, some really deep and mysterious problems that the standard model just cannot address. Uh, and one of them is to do with a, 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 a sort of a mirror image of the ordinary particles, the ordinary matter particles, something you may have heard of called antimatter. So um, every particle, every matter particle in the standard model, the quarks, the electrons and the neutrinos uh, have a mirror image which has exactly the same properties but the opposite electric charge. And we call these antiparticles. And we've known about antiparticles since the 1930s and they're routinely created in experiments and their properties are understood very well. Um, but one of the problems with this, this, the standard model is that it tells us that whenever we create a particle, we also create an antiparticle at the same time. And if you use this sort of logic to understand the beginnings of the universe, what happened at a very early time, sort of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, you had huge amounts of energy being converted into matter and antimatter. And these two forms of, of matter were kind of being created and annihilated uh, repeatedly. And as the universe expanded and cooled, the matter and the antimatter met up and annihilated each other. Now, because the standard model says whenever you make a particle, you have to make an antiparticle, and whenever you annihilate a particle, you have to annihilate an antiparticle. What should have happened is that there, these two equal quantities of matter and antimatter should have totally annihilated each other and left us with an empty, dark, lifeless universe. But that's not the universe we find ourselves living in, fortunately. So the universe has got lots of stuff in it, and so we don't, we don't understand how this happened. How is it that enough matter got left over after the Big Bang to create all the stuff that we see around us? This is a really big problem uh, for, for, for the standard model. So we know there must be some new physics to explain what happened very early on in the history of the universe that allowed this little imbalance to occur. Um, another big problem, is actually, so there's a clue to it in this image. This is a shot of a, a cluster of galaxies called the Abel Cluster. It's a big collection of galaxies sort of hanging about together in deep space. And if you look very closely at this image, you hopefully see that there's a sort of circular smearing pattern. This, this is the cluster in the middle. You see this bright, all these bright blobs, which are galaxies. And then there's this circular smearing that you can kind of see, almost like a kind of a lens in between us and, and those galaxies. And this is actually an effect known as gravitational lensing, which is where the, the mass of these, these galaxies are bending space-time, and they cause light as it travels through the universe to be bent, just like a, an ordinary lens. You literally get a sort of a lens appearing in the sky. Now, the amount of bending of the light that you get depends on how much mass there is in this image. So you can kind of you can do two things. First of all, you can look at how much visible material there is, how much, how many galaxies, how much dust, and you can figure out how much mass there is. And then you can look at the lensing and figure out how much mass that says there is. And these two numbers don't agree with each other, and they don't agree with each other by a very large amount. The amount of lensing that we see uh, requires more or less five times the amount of visible matter that we can see in this picture. In other words, there's some invisible matter which we can't see, which is creating extra gravity, extra bending of space-time. And this is what we call dark matter. You can even use this to actually map dark matter. So this is a, in purple. Purple, for some reason, is the color of dark matter. And, uh, and it's overlaid on this image. Uh, and this shows you that there's a lot more stuff than we can see with our telescopes. 
Again, the standard model cannot, has no explanation for dark matter. There is no particle in that table that I just showed you which can account for this. We know, we know some things about dark matter. We know that it can't interact through the electromagnetic force because we'd see it, it would give off light, um, and it can't interact with a strong force, but it might interact with a weak force, but that's more or less all we know about it, and the standard model can't explain it. Um, this is a sort of picture of, of what we think the universe is made from. So here we have atoms, so that's us. So all the stuff that we've been studying in all of physics since we started doing this is only actually 5% of the universe. We've only really scratched the surface in terms of our understanding of what the universe is made out of. 27% is dark matter, which is this mysterious substance. It, we think it's a particle, but we're not too sure. And then there's something even more mysterious called dark energy. Uh, which is some kind of repulsive force that's causing the universe to expand at an ever-accelerating rate. Basically, what this picture tells you is that whenever you hear the word dark in physics, it's, it's a sign that we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, so as I said, the, the standard model, uh, and the standard model itself actually, has some mysteries about it. So it, this, this table may sort of slightly remind you of the periodic table of the chemical elements where you have these repeating patterns. We don't understand why there are three columns here. We don't know why they exist. They just are there. We just kind of say, oh, we observe them, we put them into the theory. And we don't really know why we have the particular forces we do. Nature could have chosen a different set of particles and a different set of forces. So we'd also like to be able to understand where this picture comes from. Um, and the Higgs itself uh, is also a mystery in, in some ways. There's lots we don't understand about the Higgs boson. Although the Higgs was discovered, what, almost seven years ago now, uh, we've managed to measure some of its properties at the Large Hadron Collider, but only quite imprecisely. So it looks very much like the Higgs boson that Peter Higgs and his colleagues predicted in the 60s, but there's still uh, a, a strong, strong possibility that it's not the, the standard Higgs boson, that it's something more exotic. And we have to study this thing more precisely to really figure out if that's true or not. So as I said, the LHC has got uh, a program that's going to take it through until 2035, and we're still very hopeful that it may discover new physics that could help it tackle some of these problems. But whether it does or not, it's very unlikely to be able to solve everything. We're still going to have unsolved questions at the end of this process, although what the LHC does discover in that time will to some extent dictate what comes after it, because we'll probably build a machine that helps us probe the things that we've got the most evidence for. Um, so this is the proposal. So this is the, a, a map of what could become uh, the successor to the LHC, the Future Circular Collider. So it's a proposal for a 100-kilometer circumference tunnel. Uh, you can see here's the LHC up here. And the LHC would now be acting as a sort of a feeder, a sort of motorway slipway, which would inject particles into this much, much larger ring. Um, and the reason we want to go bigger is the bigger the collider, the more powerful, the, the, the higher the energy you can get the particles to. And that means that you can make more massive particles. So it could be, for example, that the particle that accounts for dark matter is too heavy for the LHC to make. But so in, in, in which case, we will need a bigger machine to be able to produce these things. Um, this is a sort of a nice visualization of what you might see if you went down into the tunnel. I assume it's not all going to be covered in chrome, but it looks... It looks really futuristic and space agey. Anyway, so that, that's your accelerator. That's the tube that carries the, the particles. And then, just like at the LHC, there will be caverns uh, around this ring where the particles are brought together and they will collide inside gigantic particle detectors that may or may not look a bit like this. Uh, and these are sort of essentially huge three-dimensional digital cameras that record what happens in, in the collisions. And that's the, so very similar to the LHC, but on a, on a bigger scale. Um, so I, I'm going to briefly say a, a bit about the more specifically what these two, uh, what this machine uh, may end up being like. There's actually the, what's called the Future Circular Collider is really a proposal for two different machines, and as which one gets built in which order uh, will depend in some part on what happens at the LHC in the next few years. But the first sort of phase of this project is for an electron-positron collider. So this is an accelerator that collides electrons with their antimatter versions called positrons or anti-electrons. Now, these machines are, are really great for doing precision measurements because you, you have these two fundamental particles, you know exactly what their energy is, and when they collide, they annihilate perfectly, and then 
convert into Higgs bosons or whatever it is that you're, you're interested in looking for. And that means you have, a, they're very, very good. It's for example, if you want to measure the, the properties of the Higgs boson at high precision, oh dear, things falling over there. Um, if you want to measure the Higgs boson at high precision, this kind of machine is great for doing that. Um, the problem with electron-positron colliders is that when you make an electron accelerate in a circle, it gives off X-ray radiation called synchrotron radiation. And the, the more you accelerate them, the faster they radiate their energy away. And so this is actually used at facilities like Diamond, where they use the, the X-rays that come off accelerating beams of electrons to study the structures of materials. But for a particle accelerator, where we want to collide things, it's a real problem, because it becomes very difficult to get the electrons to very high energies. So electron-positron colliders tend to have lower, uh, lower collision energies, but they're very good for doing precision measurements. Um, then you have proton-proton uh, colliders like the Large Hadron Collider. Now, the advantage of proton-proton colliders is that protons are much heavier than electrons, and that means that they radiate, these, they give off these X-rays at a much lower rate than electron-positron colliders, and consequently, you can get these protons to much, much higher energies. They're very good if you want to reach out into sort of the high-energy world and create very heavy particles. The disadvantage is that protons are sort of, they're not fundamental particles, they're messy bags of quarks and gluons. When you smash them into each other, you get a whole lot of mess just all over the place. So this is a typical image from the Atlas experiment at CERN, at the LHC, and you can see the number of tracks that are being created in this collision. It's, it's a to, you know, trying to find uh, a Higgs boson in this, for example, it's sort of like trying to find a needle in an exploding haystack. It's really a nightmare. So there's much higher backgrounds, so they're, very, they're good in terms of getting to high energy, but there are big challenges in terms of analyzing the data, and you have to use very clever techniques to sift out the stuff you're interested in. Um, another problem, in a sense, this is a photo of the LHC. Because these protons are massive and they're going at very high speeds, you need incredibly strong magnets to bend these particles around the ring, and those magnets are also very expensive, so these colliders tend to be slightly more pricey. Uh, than electron-positron colliders. So there's two proposals that I said. Um, I'm just going to show you, just take you uh, very briefly through the history of um, some accelerators at CERN, so you understand the interplay of these two different types of machine. So back in the uh, back in the 1980s, the most powerful accelerator at CERN was the Super Proton Synchrotron. Um, it was seven kilometers in circumference. It, got uh, particles up to an energy of what's called 400 giga electron volts. So that, is the, that, that energy is equivalent to the amount of energy carried by an electron if you accelerate it through 400 billion volts. And that's the kind of typical unit we use in particle physics. To give you a sense, the mass of a proton is one giga electron volt. So this accelerator in principle could make something 400 times heavier than a proton. Then, uh, so what happened at the superproton synchrotron is that this, had, this is a hadron collider, it's a proton-proton collider, which is very good for discovering new things, and indeed it did make some really exciting discoveries. It discovered uh, what are known as the W, part, the w and the Z bosons, which are the force particles of the weak force. They've been predicted by theory in the 1970s. This was a really exciting time, this was in the mid-1980s. Then after the superproton synchrotron, CERN built a machine called the Large Electron Positron Collider, which was a 27 kilometer particle accelerator. Uh, it's actually the tunnel that the LHC is in was built for this machine. And what the Large Electron Positron Collider did, because it was uh, uh, colliding these elementary particles with each other, is it could measure the properties of the W and the Z particles very precisely. So the, S the SPS discovered them, but then the Large Electron Positron Collider could really pin down their properties in a lot of detail and tell us lots of interesting things about the nature of the weak force and, and also about the standard model. And then after the Large Electron Positron Collider switched off in the year 2000, work on the Large Hadron Collider begin, uh, began, and it was eventually brought online successfully in 2009 in the same tunnel, but you can see the difference in energy. So you go from 400 giga electron volts to 209 for the Large Electron Positron Collider, and that's because of this problem with electrons radiating all their energy away, and then you get to much higher energies with the Large Hadron Collider, 13 tera electron volts, so trillion electron volts. And then this machine, as a discovery machine, discovered a new particle, which is the Higgs boson. So this is the general pattern that's been established at CERN, at least in the last few decades. The plan for the, the future circular collider, uh, the sort of, I guess the sort of standard view would be, the first phase would be to build an 100-kilometer tunnel in which you would put 
an electron-positron machine. And the, the objective of this machine would be to study the Higgs at very high precision. And then after that, you would have a much more powerful Hadron Collider going up to about 100 tera electron volts. And that would be the machine that could really give you the best chance of discovering brand new particles. Um, so, right, in the next, well, five minutes or so, six, seven minutes, I'm going to have to try and explain the, the actual physics of these things. So what would we want to do? Well, at the electron-positron collider, what, what this machine would allow us to do is to study the properties of the Higgs boson at really, really high precision. And this is interesting because the Higgs is actually a, a really unique particle in the standard model. It's, um, it's the only particle in the standard model which has no spin. So all the other particles behave as if they're, they're spinning around. The Higgs is spinless, and this gives it a unique set of properties and a unique set of theoretical problems associated with it. Um, to give you uh, an example of what, this, what these kind of measurements could do, um, there's a possibility that the Higgs boson could act as a sort of gateway between the ordinary matter in the standard model and what we call the dark sector or the hidden sector. So this is the world of dark matter. So if you can imagine, you have the standard model over here and then on separated because it doesn't interact with any of the forces in the standard model, you have dark matter, this kind of parallel universe effectively of stuff that we can't touch or see. Well, there's a possibility that the Higgs boson acts as a kind of gateway, so it, it interacts with the standard model particles, but also with this hidden sector. And so by measuring its properties very precisely, you can detect evidence of it interacting with these dark matter particles. So it would be a way of indirectly finding evidence of the existence of dark matter. Um, another possibility, so again at the electron-positron collider, the way that Higgs bosons will be made is, is sort of goes something like this. So you have your electron, you accelerate it to very high energy, and you bang it into a positron, they annihilate, and you produce together a, a Z boson and a Higgs boson. Now, again, if the Higgs interacts with dark matter particles, sometimes when you make a Higgs boson, instead of decaying into ordinary particles in the standard model, it will decay into dark matter particles. So you end up with a Higgs decaying into, say, two dark matter particles. Now, the problem with dark matter particles is you can't see them. So they will just fly out of your detector, and you don't leaving no trace. But because you have this Z boson here, which you do see, you're able to figure out there's some missing energy because something invisible has gone shooting off in this direction, and we've got something that we can see over here. And that would allow us, again, to indirectly detect evidence of dark matter. Um, Another, so, so one of the uh, really sort of exciting prospects, and this is something for the, the big machine, this is for the, the Hadron-Hadron Collider, the Proton-Proton Collider, is to do with uh, something called the Higgs field itself. So this is, so in, uh, in particle physics, we don't actually think of particles as little sort of billiard balls or Lego bricks. We, the, actual, the actual building blocks of the universe are fields. So uh, for example, the electromagnetic field, which is filling this room, now, a photon, which is a, the particle of the electromagnetic field, we, is thought of as a little vibration, a little ripple moving about in this field. In the same way, the Higgs boson is a little ripple moving about in this Higgs field that fills the entire universe. Um, now, the, the Higgs field uh, is unique among all the fields in the standard model in that if you take a, a bit of space and you get rid of all the particles, so you remove all the atoms, all the electrons, all the protons and neutrons, then the, the values of all the other fields, like the electromagnetic field, the electron field, they have values that are very, very close to zero, except for some little quantum fluctuations. But the Higgs field has a fixed value everywhere in space. It has a kind of non-zero value. And it's this non-zero value that causes this property, which we call mass, to exist. Now, the Higgs field effectively switched on at a very early point in the universe. There was a, there was a phase transition where the Higgs field went from having no value to acquiring the value it now does. And, therefore, and at that moment, about a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, all the particles in the standard model suddenly acquired mass as the Higgs field switched on. So it's a, I said it's a phase transition. You can think of it a little bit like uh, water droplets forming. So in, the, in this very early phase in the universe's history, you, had, you could almost think of sort of pre this phase transition, the Higgs field is a bit like a gas, and then it condenses into sort of a liquid, effectively, in, in different places in the universe. And 
there are some ideas that the asymmetry between matter and antimatter that we see in the universe happened when the Higgs field switched on in the very early universe. So, so if we can study this phase transition when the Higgs field acquired the value that it now does, we may be able to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry that we see. In other words, we'll be able to answer the question, why is there stuff in the universe? And the thing that's really exciting about the proton-proton collider is because it will be able to reach these incredible energies, 100 trillion electron volts, it will recreate the energy conditions that existed at this very early time just after the Big Bang. And if the uh, Higgs field is implicated in why there's stuff in the universe, then we will hopefully be able to measure its behavior and see whether we can explain uh, the difference between matter and antimatter that we see in the universe through the Higgs field. One other thing, that, and, and, so another, another possibility um, at the proton-proton collider so is, is again to do with dark matter. So the, the measurements I mentioned at the electron-positron collider were mostly indirect. So they were kind of, you see sort of evidence of something through the properties of the, the Higgs boson. Now, um, this, is a, this is a picture which represents um, the, the, the distribution of dark matter in a typical galaxy. So a galaxy like the Milky Way, for example, is a spiral galaxy, which is a relatively thin, circular disk. And we th from looking at the way that stars and galaxies move around, astronomers estimate that, that each galaxy is surrounded by a halo of dark matter. And the most popular explanation for what dark matter is over the last um, few years has been something called a WIMP which stands for weakly in interacting massive particle. So what that basically means is it's some kind of particle, which is often given the symbol chi for some reason, um, which has no electric charge, but interacts through the weak force. So it sort of these things are floating about in a diffuse cloud surrounding the galaxy. Um, and, and, and this is the, kind of the, the most popular, the most studied form of dark matter. And the thing that's really exciting, another thing that's very exciting about the proton-proton collider is that because it has, can reach such high energy, it will be able to more or less explore the entire energy regime where we think these kind of WIMPs ought to exist. In other words, it will be able either to discover dark matter particles, these WIMP particles, or rule out their existence, in which case we'll know that dark matter needs to be something else, some other type of particle that isn't a WIMP, effectively. Um, Another, I'll just very quickly plug something. So this is my experiment uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, or at least the experiment that I'm a part of. There are about 1,000 people working on it. It's called LHCB. And in the last few years, um, LHCB has seen a number of interesting deviations from the standard model, none of them yet big enough to really conclusively say that we've seen new physics. But, they, but if, when, when our results are finally updated with more data, Hopefully, what we'll find is, if these results are confirmed, they will be indirect evidence of some high-energy particles uh, coming in and interfering with the way that the standard model particles behave. And it's very likely that if these effects are confirmed, and I don't know whether they will be or not, that the particles responsible for these deviations will only be accessible by a machine more powerful than the Large Hadron Colliders. This is another sort of reason why we would need to go out and build this, this bigger machine. I'll just finish off finally by saying um, there's also the, the, possibly the most sort of tantalizing prospect is that we discover something totally unexpected. Um, whenever we've built a new particle accelerator, we've found something new. And quite often, the biggest breakthroughs in our understanding of nature come when we get a result that we really didn't see coming. So and there's a very good chance, because this, these machines will explore this unexplored region of, of the subatomic world, that we'll find something totally unexpected, and in which case that could be, have a really revolutionary effect on our understanding of, of the structure of, of reality. And just to re-emphasize the point I made at the beginning, that we only actually, with the standard model, have been studying 5% of the universe. We've only really scratched the surface. We're at the beginning, really, of a, of a journey towards, a, hopefully, a, a fuller understanding of the universe. And this, the Future Circular Collider is one of the best, uh, best tools that we could have to continue that uh, journey of exploration. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. So, minds blown slightly. Uh, I think, I hope, if it was up to a vote of people in this room, uh, you would probably say, yeah, this sounds like an interesting thing. Let's figure out how to do it. Can we just see a vote of hands? Is Good. 
because you've paid money to come here and hear about it, you're obviously a biased audience. But not everybody would agree with you, certainly not at the beginning. Uh, and so we need to think about how to make the case for a very large investment in scientific research like uh, the next big collider. And we need to do it in a way that a skeptical audience, uh, not just an audience of, of um, enthusiastic uh, smiling faces. Uh, so there is a sort of checklist that one can refer to for big science projects. And I'll, I'll take us through that as we, as, uh, we get ready for takeoff uh, with a big project like this. So your pilot is in, um, is in the cockpit. And in building any big science mega project, the pilot's checklist has to go through a number of key requirements. Harry has outlined the science case, the reason why you would do such a thing. But there's a number of reasons how, or things that need to be in place for the how. And it's, it's part of the, the success of big science in particle physics, in astronomy, in space research, in the Human Genome Project, all of these very ambitious things to be able to marry a visionary goal driven by science with the resources and the organization and the engineering and the R&D and the technical capability to actually deliver on it. Not just an aspiration like hoping one day we will cure science, uh, cure cancer, though I very much hope we will, but a practical goal like putting a person on the moon by the end of the 1960s. So that's what we're trying to do here. Technical case, cost estimates, project management plan, funding, governance, stakeholder engagement, and something called a business case, which is basically what you would tell the Treasury if you had 30 seconds uh, of, of pitch with the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, to say this is a good investment for the public purse, for the taxpayer. So this is my current project, which is dramatically smaller. It's only one kilometer long. It is, however, a particle accelerator and will be more powerful than anything at CERN when it starts operating. This is a machine for material science research. This is a spin-off from particle physics, and I'm responsible for the construction of this. It's roughly two billion pound project under construction in Sweden, of which the UK is, is a proud member, a European collaboration uh, to build a new science facility. Before being responsible for this, I was the chief executive of the Science and Technology Facilities Council, which is the funding agency, the research council in the United Kingdom, that's responsible for basic research in areas like particle physics and nuclear physics and, and space. So I do have some experience with skeptical audiences in the Treasury and elsewhere, uh, and I hope that that experience can be useful to the FCC. I'm a member of the International Steering Committee uh, for this project, and, and I would love to see it succeed. So Harry's talked about the science, but if you had to condense that to one slide, uh, people in America talk about an elevator pitch. Imagine you are in a lift with a decision maker and you have 30 seconds between getting on at the floor you got on at and getting off at the floor you both get off at. How would you condense your story into a very, very short number of bullet points? So here I've attempted to condense Harry's uh, presentation into one slide. We found the Higgs boson, it was the last piece of the 20th century jigsaw puzzle, but nature has put more pieces out there. Dark matter was never predicted in the standard model, but the observations in big telescopes and, and the Hubble Space Telescope prove that it's there. We don't know what underlies that. There are two approaches to discovery then, high precision, which the electron-positron collider in the FCC tunnel would be able to deliver, measure what you know about very precisely, and the brute force approach of a very much higher energy collider to try to directly ask nature, what are you made of? Can we make new things like we were able to make the Higgs boson at the LHC that we didn't know about so far? Now CERN has stewardship of a strategy for particle physics, which attempts to organize all of the European laboratories that are active in this area of research and the scientists in the various universities every five years to update the investment plan and the research plan for Europe. And clearly, since the last time uh, this, this process was carried out, we've learned a lot more about the Higgs. We've continued to do experiments at the LHC, and it's timely to do an update. So February last year, there was a call for scientific input, and the conceptual design of the FCC, which we're talking about, is one of the inputs into this strategy process. We hope that the strategy symposium and then the... Um, the five-year sort of master plan, which is not a very dense document. It, it, it's a, a few pages, but it lays out the priorities for investment. We hope that that will endorse uh, continuing to take the FCC project forward as one of the priorities. Because as Harry has said, the investment timelines are long. 
The R&D may take a decade to do, and if things don't get started now, uh, particle physics could be left in the 2020s without a clear plan uh, for, for what to do next. There are, however, some other competing options, and we can talk about that in the, in the Q&A, if you like. So science case is, is there. The technical case uh, and the R&D needed and the cost estimation, well, let's just put the cost numbers up there because they are large, and nobody would deny that these are expensive investments. So for the first phase, the electron-positron machine, uh, the estimate uh, with, with engineering consultancy and, and serious um, study is something like 12 billion Swiss francs. We costed it in Swiss francs because the assumption is that the bulk of the money would be spent at CERN. And the dominant cost is the cost of the tunnel. 100 kilometers of tunnel, 62 miles of tunnel is an expensive thing. So that drives the cost, and that tells you what you, you are not likely to be able to spend less than. To go then to upgrade to the second phase will cost you an additional 17 billion Swiss francs, of which 11 is for superconducting magnets, as Harry said. Keeping the rings of the protons circulating in, in even this very large tunnel requires a very high magnetic field. And the whole program, which might be spent over 35 years or more, is then 29 billion Swiss francs, or 24 billion if you skip the first course and just go straight to the main course. So the two major technologies that we need to think about are the tunnel and these high field magnets. This is an overlay again of the tunnel uh, on the Swiss-French border just to show the sheer scale of the thing. Uh, 100 kilometers, 62 miles in circumference. That means 20 miles across, stretches from here to roughly Heathrow Airport. This is a very big engineering challenge in itself. The land is not hugely mountainous. Uh, this is the, the end of, the, of Lake Geneva where the Rhone River starts, so it's not a hugely deep tunnel excavation, and that means you can sink about 16 shafts around the circumference of the tunnel, which makes it quicker and easier to build, but tunnels are not simple. Uh, here's another, uh, that picture, that visualization. I think this is way too Star Trek uh, for, for real life. It will be a concrete tunnel. The point I just wanted to make here is the size of it uh, is not huge, but it has to be roughly twice the width of the magnets that you want to put in there so that you can transport them in and install them and so that one can access for repairs. Um, a good example of 100 kilometers of tunnel in Switzerland has been excavated in the last few years. The Gotthard Base Tunnel, which is a railway tunnel, two 57-kilometer bores under the Alps uh, linking Zurich with Milan. Uh, that costs 12.2 billion Swiss francs. Tunneling is a mature technology. It's understood. It's not simple. The geology uh, makes things complicated. It can be dangerous, but it's predictable. And it's unlikely that there will be any dramatic breakthroughs in tunneling that would reduce the, the cost or time taken to do that. So the cost of digging a 100-kilometer tunnel and the time taken to do it is understandable, and we need to be sensible about it. The other technology, however, needs much more R&D. And that's one reason why the second phase of the FCC may well come as the second phase. It requires magnets, superconducting magnets, so that means they're cooled to a few degrees above absolute zero, so there's no electrical resistance in the wires. You have to use special materials to have that property of being superconducting. And we want to run this machine with collision energies that are something like seven to 10 times higher than the LHC. And that means having a higher magnetic field to bend the particle beams and keep them circulating in the tunnel. And we're looking for 16 Tesla magnets compared with roughly you know, one, one Tesla for, for typical everyday applications. And that means new materials. Uh, we're using, we'll, we will have to use an alloy of niobium and tin, which is a very difficult material to work with. It requires a lot of heat treatment. Uh, and maybe high temperature superconductors, which are even more uh, uh, difficult to work with ceramic materials, more exotic materials, not used because of operating at a higher temperature, but because they can withstand higher magnetic fields and still remain superconducting. Expensive, costly, and an engineering challenge. We need to reduce the cost by a factor of three to five compared with, with existing technology used at the LHC. Now, a project management plan for a 20 to 30 billion franc project is not optional, it is mandatory, and there are good examples of engineering project management uh, to be found everywhere in, in the world of big projects. 
For example, the American Department of Energy has a very well-respected project management uh, approach based on that used at NASA. Uh, it's, it's DOE Order 413B, and those of us who've worked in American labs you know, know exactly the steps needed. But the key points in managing any big project are to have a proper schedule with tasks at the ESS. At my project, we have 24,000 tasks linked in a project management tool called Primavera. So we know when every job finishes, what other jobs are depending on it to start. We know how many people should be working on it, and we can track the progress exactly through. And ESS is now 50 58% complete according to that measure. Uh, we need sufficient contingency, money kept back for things that you haven't predicted because your, your initial estimates are never fully accurate and you need to deal with them and you need an engineering change control process to keep track of what you're doing. Credible funding and governance plan. So if you go and talk, if you had that elevator ride with the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer or the Science Minister of Germany or any of the people we would need to invest in this, you want not just to reassure them that you know how to do the project, you need to tell them how you're going to pay for it and how much they would have to pay. And these get to be tricky negotiations and they're very political. So let me emphasize at this point that what I say is not official CERN policy and it's not necessarily even official FCC policy. It's my advice as a private citizen on how you might be able to build something of this size and complexity by involving all of the people that you need to involve. So the first thing is to look at existing examples of what we're trying to do. And the closest thing I could find is the international fusion project, ITER, which is under construction in the south of France. This is a, deserves an RI presentation of its own to build a very, very large um, uh, magnetic confinement system in which you can replicate the nuclear reactions that are taking place that power the sun and try to capture that as an energy source on Earth. This is a 20 to 30 to much more billion project. Uh, the actual cost is, is a little bit obscure. Uh, it is an international organization, but it involves many agencies from projects all around, or from countries all around the world, and there are huge challenges in building something of this size with this scale of collaboration, which have led to uh, some lessons that ITER itself has learned about what not to do. So any project like FCC should learn what not to do and copy what does work. Oops, I keep pressing that too much. So, so this is the key question then that you'd have to satisfy the Chancellor of the Exchequer or the German Science Minister. Could you actually afford 28 billion Swiss francs? The Swiss franc is... Uh, about 85 pence or something like that. So it's not so different from, from the cost of HS2 or something like that. It is a big investment. Well, the best way to do that is to spread it over many years and to share it between many partners, and that's exactly what we would propose to do here. The existing CERN budget, to which the UK contributes about £130 million per year, could pay for roughly half of the cost of this FCC programme over the 30 years that it would take to realize without asking for any more money. So you'd simply have to convince the Chancellor of the Exchequer that CERN was continuing to be a good investment for the UK taxpayer over that period. And I hope that's a, a more straightforward thing to do. And I don't want to have to appeal to this lady here, the magic money fairy, uh, to say that we will you know, find money from a Silicon Valley billionaire or something like that. I think it's fair to ask the two host countries, Switzerland and France, to contribute a bit extra because a lot of the money of that tunneling will be spent in their countries, on their companies, in their economy. And then the third thing that we need to do is get contributions from outside of Europe in the same way that ITER has done, a substantial investment from the United States and Russia and China and Japan and wherever else. And that means most of that work would need to be done in those places because the, the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Americans are unlikely to just write a check to, to CERN and say, spend the money in Switzerland as you wish. They're going to want to do the work at home because as, uh, as has long been noted, politics is local. People get elected by local constituencies and they want to be able to demonstrate a return on that investment locally. So that's what we are having to do in my project at ESS as well. Significant technical work packages procured or constructed in the partner countries and then brought to the project to be integrated. It's a project management challenge, but it's a political necessity, and I think FCC is going to need to, to handle this. This is an example of an in-kind deliverable at ESS. You probably don't know who either of these gentlemen on the right are. Does anybody wish to guess? 
No, they're obscure. It's the president of Italy, and I can forgive you for not knowing who he is, and the king of Sweden, and I can forgive you for not knowing who he is either. Um, but they're shaking hands because the king of Sweden is, is ceremonially accepting this component that has been built in Italy for ESS. And this means that the Italians can spend money in their own national laboratories promoting their own science and engineering investments, but contribute to a European project uh, which is taking place in, in, in another country. Stakeholder engagement. You are stakeholders in this project. Uh, the general public uh, are, are a key part of it, but there are many other stakeholders. And earlier in my life, I had the privilege of working on this project, the Superconducting Super Collider, which was about one third finished in a place called Waxahachie, Texas. And yes, that is a real place. And it is exactly like you would think it would be. Pickup trucks and big hair. Well, it was the 1980s and 10-gallon and hats. And you aren't from round here, boy, are you? Um, but a, a, a basically larger and more powerful version of the Large Hadron Collider got about one-third complete. And you can see big tunnels dug and, and, and real money spent. And it was then cancelled by the American Congress in 1993. And that had to do with changing political priorities. But it was evidence that there wasn't a strong and deep base of support uh, for this big investment. And it was a political baby of one political party. And uh, even very big projects can get killed. So I don't want to repeat this experience. And I don't think science should. We've, we've done some studies in Europe on large research infrastructures in a, in a forum that I've chaired. And we found that stakeholder engagement and the funding plan are often the reason why things don't get built, not the lack of science case or the technical R&D. So stakeholders include you, the general public, but they also include decision makers, the people who shape opinion. They include scientists in other research fields. They include university bosses, civil servants, and economists. And you might think that the toughest and most skeptical audience here would be the the civil service economists in the exchequer, and they're pretty tough. But actually, the most skeptical and hardest to convince are often scientists in other research fields who are worried about whether this investment may, may draw money out of theirs. Uh, and those are people we need to work on. And if you've been following FCC in the media and on Twitter, you will have seen that there are people from other science areas who say, this is a very expensive thing, and we're not sure what it will do. So we need to convince all of these. And in fact, if we have many partner countries, there needs to be an effort to convince the people in each of those partner countries, because they have different media, they have different political parties, they have different decision-making priorities. And finally, business case. Business case is what the Treasury down the road in Whitehall talk about when they want to make an investment. It doesn't mean it has to have anything to do with business, but it just means they have to be able to justify a return on the investment of taxpayer money. And continued investment in CERN, even if it is still at the level that, that we've been making for 20 years, requires a business case. Because every time there's a big new commitment, people realize that's sort of locking in your participation for many decades to come. So they will want to see such a business case. And we can provide it. And let me outline. So don't be frightened by the word business. It just means an investment case. You're investing tax money. Any international project is going to need to tailor it. Because the reasons why the Indian government might invest in a project like FCC as a developing country trying to build up a technology base would be very different from the reasons why the Swiss might invest in it. It's in their country, they're going to get a big return. Or why the UK might invest in it. And it needs to be tailored, and we need to accept that. We've also seen a shift in priorities for science investment since the end of the Cold War. And the end of the Cold War is a great thing, and I'm not de decrying that at all. But science used to be sellable in terms of uh, cultural value, international collaboration in a time of tension, uh, showing that a democratic system can make uh, progress. Uh, and, and all of those things have been um, superseded or certainly eclipsed in the minds of those treasury bureaucrats much more by what does it do for jobs? What does it do for national competitiveness in a globalizing economy? And those may seem a bit banal. Those may seem a bit short-term compared with understanding the cultural value of understanding our place in the universe. But if those are the decision-making criteria that the people with the checkbooks want to use, we can certainly explain in language they will understand what a project like the FCC will indeed do. 
So here's a scientist doing science. And you will notice she is a girl, and I will talk about that later. And she is understanding the universe in the way that Harry has described, by building big machines and colliding particles together and using elaborate computer programs to find the new things that are made. Unfortunately, that requires public scale investments. Universities by themselves don't have big enough budgets uh, to be able to build things like CERN. CERN is a, a treaty organization which member state governments contribute to, and that means government investment decisions are made. Now, much as we may wish it were otherwise, our governments are not philosopher kings in the platonic ideal. They don't particularly value knowledge for its own sake. They value the technology and the innovation and the skills that come out as perhaps a side effect or perhaps integral to the realization of the project. But they're not looking at the value of the Higgs boson. They're looking at the value of those magnets and the training and the inspiration. So let's talk about the technology and the innovation and the skills that come out of basic research. This may be a little bit like not selling the steak and selling the sizzle. That's an old 1950s advertising slogan, sell the experience. Tailor your message to what the audience wants to hear. Scientists don't always like doing this. It feels a bit like salesmanship. It is salesmanship, after all. But we are selling something that is of value. We're using the language that the audience understands. So the biggest economic challenges of today, uh, if you were in that lift with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, globalization, together with automation, leading to fewer good jobs, leading to very unhappy people leading to Donald Trump in the White House and Brexit and all manner of other things, gilets jaunes protesters in Paris. There are big other problems that we cannot ignore, like climate change, and we must not ignore. But for political actors thinking about their next election, they're focused on this stuff right now. And projects like the FCC may seem a million miles away from low growth and stagnant wages and steelworks in Scunthorpe closing. But the reality is that investment in science and technology, scientific and technological innovation, and specifically STEM skills, scientific, technology, engineering, and mathematics skills, economies that have an educated workforce are going to be able to withstand these kind of shocks much, much better. So what can the FCC or what can basic research do to help this sort of situation. They can develop transformative technologies and they can attract young people into science and train them for the 21st century. In fact, the Institute of Physics did a study a few years ago that something like 90% of physics undergraduates in UK universities had originally decided to study physics because of an interest in particle physics or astronomy. The reason you're all here tonight, to understand the fundamental structure of the universe. This kind of science is an entry drug into a career or an interest or a motivation to understand science and technology and engineering. And those are skills that the UK economy needs. Something like 50,000 more scientific and technologically trained people per year uh, based on the requirements of manufacturing industry. So there's a need for more people, and this is a way to encourage more into those very productive and useful careers. Now, you all know about the World Wide Web technology innovation in information sharing that was invented at CERN as a way to communicate in the construction of the Large Hadron Collider. You may not be so familiar that Wi-Fi is also a spin-off from basic research. The algorithms, the computer algorithms used to decode the Wi-Fi signal in a very radio noisy environment were invented for radio astronomy in Australia, it so happens, by a team of scientists who were trying to test one of the predictions of Stephen Hawking about black holes. So, uh, and the, the proof of this is that the, the Wi-Fi chipset in your phone pays royalties to the Commonwealth Science and Industry Research Organization in Australia for the use of those algorithms. So it's not just a vague link, it's a real monetary benefit to Australian astronomy uh, that this happens. So I can't promise that the FCC will deliver you a replacement for the World Wide Web or a replacement for Wi-Fi. There's a good track record of these kind of spin-offs, but what I can promise is that it will generate new higher magnetic field magnets, and the original superconducting magnet technology is itself a spin-off of particle physics. Back in the 
late 70s and early 80s. The Tevatron accelerator at Fermilab in the United States was looking to build the first large-scale installation of superconducting magnets anywhere. And they placed orders with companies to deliberately stimulate the creation of an industry, to, to take steps to create companies able to build these things that didn't exist up till now. And that led then to the emergence of a multi-billion dollar market for superconducting magnets driven by medical imaging machines. And so the commercial value of the medical imaging industry is several billion per year. And the value to all of us from having MRI scanners in every hospital is many times that in terms of improved lifestyles and healthcare. So if we think about a project like FCC, we should try and maximize those sort of impacts. And that means involving industry and key R&D packages and setting up places where that innovation can happen. And a really good example is just down the road from here at the Harwell campus. The European Space Agency runs a business incubation center here next to the Diamond Light Source, which provides help to commercialized technologies that have been invented and devised from the European Space Agency to make sure they actually get out into the market and, and make things happen. Zupla, for example, uses a location technology, a location mapping technology that was part of the European Space Agency's um, innovation program originally. So something like this uh, is a good example of how to maximize your economic impact, small companies. We also need to think about how to attract young people into science. Well, you've already been attracted because you're here. And the Higgs discovery was a really good example of how one can do that. It was front page news, even in the Financial Times. Uh, and when I was at STFC, and in fact, worked, the first time I met Harry, uh, was in putting together an exhibition at the Science Museum, uh, which celebrated the Large Hadron Collider and what had been discovered. And we made sure to invite people like George Osborne, who at the time was influential, uh, and um, <laughs> introduced him to, to Stephen Hawking and Peter Higgs, and, uh, and made sure that this got out to the general public, but also key decision makers, like the people in the ministry. So we put a vinyl, uh, we, STFC at that time, put a vinyl wrapping on the front entrance to the ministry that was respons is responsible for science funding in the UK. So all the 2,000 civil servants were walking, working there would walk past a big picture of the LHC on their way into work, and I hope feel a little bit of pride at having supported that. And this was then picked up uh, as part of the, the UK um, knowledge promotion uh, in embassies overseas and has had a real tangible impact. So people have talked about something that's called the Brian Cox effect, an increase in the study of physics in, in British universities after the Higgs and following the, the wonders of the universe and all of that. And it shows that you really can change the choices that young people make. And I, I don't want to sound patronizing, but I hope that the, the youthful faces smiling in the audience here are already interested in science. We need to reach out to the people who aren't in this audience yet. Um, the, the public engagement program around the Higgs discovery reached more than half of the population of the UK in one way or another, through TV, through newspapers, through magazines, through, through all of the materials that we put out. So I would like to set a big goal for something like the FCC. If we set aside as little as 1% of the budget in the UK alone, we could spend 12 million pounds on promoting science, which is much more than was ever spent on the LHC uh, Higgs Discovery Outreach Program. And so a good goal might be to double the number of girls taking A-level physics, which as you can see from these charts remains very low in comparison to the number of boys. The numbers taking, of both genders taking the subject have increased, which is good, but this uh, gender imbalance has not shifted, or doubling the number of engineering apprentices. And something like this in every one of the partner countries of, of FCC would, I think, be a good, a good goal. So there we have a checklist. And I've very quickly and breathlessly uh, tried to go through all of these reasons why investment in FCC is a good thing and how you might convince skeptical audiences that it is a good thing, not just because the science is fascinating, but because it has tangible short-term benefits as well, and because it's affordable, and because you could imagine putting together a credible R&D plan to deliver it. So we know what we have to do. No one said it would be easy, but we don't do these hard things because they're easy, right? This is a many-decade project to build what will be, by many orders of magnitude, the largest science experiment that the world has ever seen 
if it is successfully realized. And so we should not expect it to be straightforward, but we have to present a plausible route to success, and I think that's what we can do. And so finally, I'd just like to close with a, a quote from Daniel Burnham, who you may not have heard of, but he's a, a city planner and architect who was responsible for a master plan of Chicago over 100 years ago. Uh, and he famously said, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's hearts. So what we're trying to do with the FCC is certainly not make any little plans. Thanks very much.